Masechet Gitin, Daf Nun Aleph. And we're talking about a case in the Mishnah of a thief who steals, who steals land, we'll call it land A, from the owner of land A. And then this thief goes ahead and sells that land to a buyer, we'll call him buyer of A. Uh, and uh, after A buys it, he goes and improves the land and it uh, grows produce. Now, uh, owner of A comes back and says, hold on, that's my land. So he repossesses the land from A, which he has a right to do. Um, now, buyer of A, he gave money to the thief. And so buyer of A says, I want my money back. And he wants, he's claiming two things. Number one, the sale price. Second, the buyer of A also says, I want the, um, uh, the money that I put in to improve it and the produce that it produced belong to me. Thief, you have to pay me back for all of those things. The halacha of the Mishnah is that for the purchase price, that the buyer of A can collect from the thief. And if the thief has no money, then the buyer of A can go to a, another buyer. Let's say in the meantime, a thief uh, A did have some land and he had sold that land to buyer B. Uh, it would have to be that he sold to buyer B after he sold to buyer A. And therefore, buyer A has a prior claim to that land. And so, buyer A can go and say, oh, Thief, you have no money to pay me back? Well, then the land that you owned when we, you made that sale belongs to me, and buyer of A can go and collect the land from buyer B. That is legitimate for the purchase price. However, our Mishnah taught, that when it comes to the produce and improvement, there buyer A can only collect from the uh, the movables and current uh, possessions of the thief, but cannot repossess lean land because, and this is what we're talking about, but we're going to have two reasons. Yesterday we gave one reason, which is that of Ula and Rabbi Yochanan, which is that it's not in the contract. In the contract, if you look at the fine print, it says that buyer A says, I, I agree to buy it, and thief agrees that if the land should be repossessed, then he will be liable to pay back A. Since it's written in a contract, so then um, it has uh, a voice, it's publicized. It is, uh, whenever you have something in a contract, that means there's two witnesses and, and the scribe, and so everybody knows. It's kind of like recorded in the public record um, that there is a lien on the thief's property just in case uh, buyer A needs to repossess, then um, buyer beware. So buyer B, it was up to, it was his responsibility to find out, see, and know that buyer A has a lien on it, and then he can take proper precautions, and uh, he decides to buy it anyway, fine. Um, however, the produce that is not included in the contract. Let's say in the contract, and if you should produce something and put money into it, then if it gets repossessed, I will pay you back. It doesn't say that in the contract. Therefore, that's like an oral obligation. An oral obligation has no publicity, and therefore, buyer B, he has no way of protecting himself against that, and therefore, that does not, buyer A cannot collect buy from buyer B land for the produce. All that is what we saw yesterday. And that was the opinion of Ula. And now we're going to see a second opinion. And that is that of Rabbi, Yo Rabbi Hanina. Rabbi Hanina's answer is going to be that there's no set amount. For the land, there is a set amount. It's a fixed price. How much did you buy this for? One million dollars. So buyer B says, oh, there's a lien of one million dollars on your land. Okay, I'll make some calculations. Let me see what other assets you have. Let me see if it's worth my... Uh, a while to take that risk. He accepts the risks, that, that risk, that's fine. But regarding this produce, we don't know how much is going to be. How much is this land? Uh, 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 how good is this land? How much is it going to produce? That's an unspecified amount. And buyer B has no way of calculating what that amount is going to be. And therefore, um, buyer B said, I could not beware of an unspecified amount. I own, so therefore, a lien happens. And uh, according to this, it has less to do with it not being written in a contract, but rather the fact that it's not a fixed amount. Okay, so let's go to the Gemara. Rabbi Hanina Amar Lefi She'en Kesubin. All right, the reason why uh, buyer A cannot collect is because the amount of produce is not a fixed amount, and you can only make a lien on land for a fixed amount.
Good. Ibaya lehu. Question to Rabbi Chanina. The Rabbi Chanina kesubin veketubin ba'e odil ma kebus kesubin vafapi she'enam ketubim. When Rabbi Chanina says his uh, answer, is he adding to Ula or disagreeing with Ula? Um, does he say that it has to be not only has to be written in a contract? Yes, you need that too. I agree, but also has to be a fixed amount. The only time you can make a lien. In general, is if it's if it's in the contract, if it's written down, or some other form of publici- publicity, like with witnesses or something, has to be in a contract and has to be a fixed amount. And uh, if you have only one of them, no good. That's one possibility. Or to be Chanina is completely disagreeing with Ula, and he was he's saying it doesn't matter if it's written, not written in a contract. Doesn't that's fine. It just has to be a fixed amount. That's the only thing that's important. So that's what we want to know. What is his uh, to be Chanina's opinion? Well, we're going to attempt to prove it. it will, we're not going to succeed. Here's the case. This is back from Masechet uh, Ketubot. Someone has, um, some, uh, a man dies, a father dies. He has two daughters and one son. In that case, the son is going to inherit 100% of the property. Here's the thing. The daughters don't get absolutely nothing besides uh, uh, um, uh, a mizonot that they will get. Whenever the daughters uh, get married, they're entitled to 10% of the estate for their dowry. We're going to call that parnasa. Okay, so now, um, uh, so, so now one of them, one of the daughters, in fact, gets married and takes her 10%. But the second daughter didn't get married yet. And then the son died. The son died without children. So what happens to the estate? It gets split 50-50 to the two daughters. Um, but now here's the question. What about that other 10% that the second daughter could have gotten had she gotten married before the son died? Does she get that 10% and then the rest of it they split so out of the 100%, daughter A already got 10%. And if we give daughter B the other 10%, 10%, there'll be 80% of the estate left. And they'll split that 40% and 40%. And so the two daughters will end up with 50% uh, and 50% of the total estate. Or do we say, which is what Rabbi Yochanan says, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Shiniya Vitra, the second daughter forfeits her right to that 10%. Therefore, the son uh, inherited 100%. Daughter A got married first and got 10%. That leaves 90%. When the, when the son dies, they split that 90%. So daughter A gets 45 plus 10, 55 percent. Daughter B gets only 45 percent. That's Rabbi Yochanan's ruling. Rabbi Chanina disagrees. Says that makes no sense because you know what? There's an even bigger chidush, a greater law, the other way around, and that says that let's say the son. Had uh, had this estate and sells uh, sells some of the estate, and then his sister gets married, and there's nothing left in the estate to pay for her wedding. She has a lien on that land, and she can go to an, that buyer and say, "Hey, I never got my ten percent for my dowry from my brother. I can repossess your land." Um, so you can repossess for parnasa, meaning for her dowry, although you cannot repossess for regular food. The son also has an obligation to pay for regular sustenance, daily food for, to his sisters. Um, and so he has that obligation. However, if he sells the land, then they, uh, the sisters do not have a right to go and collect um, from from that land, there's no lien for mizonot. There is a lien for the dowry. So here's the question: Rabbi Chanina's question: If she, the sister, unmarried sister, can go and collect from land that the son sold to someone else altogether, then all the more so that daughter should be able to collect from the estate that's still in the family's hands. The son died, and now it will be split between herself and her own sister. So isn't that closer? Isn't that, um, isn't that a greater connection than if you sell to someone else? If there's a lien, 
when you sell it to someone else, all the more so that she should have it if it's uh, if it's within if it's being shared by the by the two sisters. So Rabbi Chanina says the second daughter should get the ten percent, and then they split the rest. And so that's his challenge to Rabbi Yochanan. And you say that the second daughter loses her right? No, that makes no sense. Okay, that's the end of the source. And now let's look at analyze what we can learn from Rabbi Chanina here. Okay, the point of this whole thing, we didn't really need the whole complicated case for the main point that we're getting from it. The main point we're getting from it is that according to Rabbi Chanina, daughter B can collect from lien property for her dowry. Now, a dowry is not a fixed, uh, is a fixed amount. It's a 10, 10%. We know exactly how much it is. Um, yet, it's now written, and the Bichanina says that she can collect it. What do we learn from here? That according to the Bichanina, it doesn't matter if it's written or not. Even if it's not written down, they can st- the, uh, uh, someone can still collect from lien property as long as it was a fixed amount. So you need fixed amount only, and you don't need it to be written. So isn't that a good proof? We say not necessarily. Shane panasa kevan di it la kala keman di chetiva dame. Panasa, a dowry is, uh, is, is, um, has publicity. When someone's getting married, everybody knows. Oh, this person getting married, right? If people who are invited, they know about it. People who are not invited, they're upset that they weren't invited, so they also know about it. But the point is, everybody knows about a wedding. A wedding is a public thing. And everybody's going to say, oh, okay, what was the dowry? And so this is going to be a public matter. That she um, that she deserves um, that she deserves and gets this dowry, and therefore um, that obligation to pay for a dowry is as if it was already written, and therefore it doesn't have to be written. It's uh, it's uh, it's a sa- it has publicity, and therefore it's as if it was written. Um, in other words, when that guy bought the land, he should have known. Oh, there's another un- unmarried daughter. She's going to collect her dowry, right? So everybody knows about that. And therefore, it's as if it's written, so you cannot prove from here. So in the end, we do not have a proof um, whether Rabbi Hanina also requires um, uh, something to be written or not, but for sure, he requires it to be a fixed um, amount. Okay, so that was the first question. Now we're going to have a challenge uh, to Ula, actually two challenges. Uh, the first question might also be a challenge to the Bichanina, um, and that will uh, uh, depend on how we interpret this, but let's keep it simple. Let's just focus on the challenge to Ula. See, we didn't uh, decide whether Ula actually agrees with, Ula, whether Bichanina agrees that it has to be written in a contract. If he does agree, then certainly it will be a question on both. All right, let's focus on the next two challenges to um, the fact that it has to be written in a contract. So we're going to see two cases uh, coming up where someone can collect even though it's not written in a contract. So here. Mativ Rav Huna Bar Manoach. Metu benotehen nizonot b'nechassim b'nechorin vehi nizonot b'nechassim meshubadim mipne shehi keba'alat chov. We have a case here of a woman who got married three times. Okay, it's not as hard as it sounds. The first time she had a daughter and that guy died. He's out of the picture, forget about him. The point is she has a daughter from a previous marriage. She gets married to the second guy and makes a deal with the second guy. Listen, you're getting married to me, it's great. I have this daughter, I want you her, I want you to sustain her for a certain amount of time. He says, okay, I will, I agree, five years, I will sustain her. Um, and then she divorces that guy, and let's say she has a daughter with B, right? So now they have a daughter also. Um, now she gets divorced from that guy, and now she marries another guy. Uh, the third husband. And the third husband, she makes the same deal. Listen, I had a daughter from my first marriage, and I want you to sustain her, please, Why, uh, uh, for the next five years. And he agrees. Okay, in that case, that's fine. So now this daughter is going to be sustained for both from both of these husbands, and if they're overlapping, that's fine too. Um, one of them will give food, one of them will give the monetary equivalent of food. Fine, they're both sustaining her. Now, and maybe she has, uh, and she has daughters, let's say, with the third guy, too. Um, and now, everyone, all the men die, right? Both, hu- the first uh, husband already died, and now these two husbands both die, um, but they have their estates. What is the obligation um, of the estates to feed 
the stepdaughter from the first marriage and their own daughters. So this Mishnah teaches that there is a difference. If uh, they their their own daughters, right, meaning the daughter of husband B with the same woman and the daughter of husband C, it could be even from the same from the same woman, they can only be sustained from free unsold property of the estate, right? That's the rule. We just mentioned it uh, uh, earlier that an estate, let's say the son, there's a son, he inherits, he has to feed his sisters um, from free property. If he sells everything, then they have no claim. However, she, the stepdaughter from the first marriage, she gets to be fed, and even if there's no, even if uh, the estate is depleted, she can go and collect from leaned property because she is like a creditor. Um, the other two, um, as a stipulation in the Ketubah that uh, says, "Listen, any daughters that we have, I want you to make sure that you uh, sustain them." But the first one is not uh, to feed to feed a stepdaughter. That's not a part of a ketubah. That's part of an agreement that they made, and therefore it's like a loan. And a loan um, gets paid from a lien. Hold on, but this loan was not written. It's not in the ketubah. So what's going on? Why should it be? Um, uh, why should it collect from leaned? The other ones for the free daughters that is in the ketubah. But we mentioned at the end of yesterday that even though it's in the ketubah, when the rabbis instituted that law, they said that it's not going to be from lean property. So the daughters don't get lean property, but the stepdaughter can collect from lean property, even though it's not written. Challenge to Ula, who says it has to be written. The answer is, Oh, we're talking about a case where they actually made an acquisition. They made a deal in front of witnesses, or they wrote it down. They did something that made it publicly public knowledge that the father, the, st- the f- stepfathers, have to pay for the stepdaughter. And because it was publicized, it's like it's written. All right. So that that answer works, but we have to be consistent, and that means if they made an acquisition, then the daughters also, we assume they made an acquisition, right? And so the daughters also should be able to get mizonot from lean property. So we answer no. The case of the their own daughters, right? The daughters of the guy who died himself, the second husband or the third husband, um, they, uh, there were, there was no acquisition done, a, act of acquisition, only for the stepdaughter an act, uh, an act of acquisition was done. Now we ask, my pasca, what, you're not, the, you, what, what would, uh, uh, give us the reason to differentiate and say, this one is this case, this one is not this case, right? This is, seems arbitrary to add these differentiations when the Mishnah didn't say anything. And so we answer, actually, it does make sense. But ishto de havai bishat kinyan, mehani le kinyan. Bito de la havai bishat kinyan, la mehane la kinyan. When this woman goes and gets married, let's say to husband B, the second husband, and uh, says, listen, I'm going to make an acquisition that you're going to feed all the daughters, all, 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 all of my daughters. Well, the stepdaughter from the first marriage is alive, and so that's something that exists, and so that, that act of acquisition will take hold and cause there to be a lien, whereas the daughters that they're going to have don't exist yet, and so the acquisition is not going to take hold on uh, the obligation to those daughters. So the truth is they did an acquisition, in a general one, at the beginning of their marriage, but it only applies to the stepdaughter because she's the only one that is alive yet. And then we say, but that's not necessarily true because we can think of a case where it would be different. Let's say you have this woman, she had a stepdaughter from a previous marriage. Okay, that guy's out of the picture. And then she has a second husband and they, they, uh, and he says, okay, you, you'll, you'll agree to, um, uh, to sustain my stepdaughter. Um, fine. Now they have children. They have daughters. Okay. Then they get divorced and then they get remarried. And then the second marriage with that second guy, she says, I want you to agree that you're going to feed all my step, all of my daughters, the, including the stepdaughter from the first marriage and the daughters that we had together in our uh, first marriage. And so in that case, there, uh, in that second marriage that 
it's her third marriage altogether, but their, their second marriage together, he is agreeing and the stepdaughter is alive and their own daughters are alive. And so could be talking about a case like that, in which case it should apply to both but the Mishnah differentiates and says that only the stepdaughter can collect from lien property, not the daughters. Why not? So we need another answer. The daughter... The da daughters get fed, um, that's part of a, a condition of the betin, right? It's a stipulation that this is true for all marriages, whether you're right in the ketubah, she gets it. Because it's basically already given to her, the act of acquisition doesn't take hold. Um, uh, the idea is that, you know, if we already did, what, if there's already some uh, uh, um, uh, acquisition because the betin says so, so then the act of acquisition has nothing to hold on to. Um, however, the stepdaughter, where there is zero obligation going uh, coming into the, that, that marriage, the second husband has zero obligation to the daughter from the previous marriage, and since, since there's no tonight betin there, there at all, the acquisition takes, takes full force. Um, and it can be, it can, it can tra transfer. That's the attempted second answer. Then we challenge that. Wait a second. You're telling me that, um, if I have no obligation and I make an acquisition, then I get a full acquisition with a lien. But if I'm already obligated by a tenai betin and then do an added, uh, um, act of acquisition, then that second act of acquisition is worth nothing and cannot, uh, take from a lien, right? It should be even, a, even a greater obligation, if anything. Rather, final answer is that regarding someone's, his own daughter, since he knows that he's going to have to uh, uh, provide for her, um, his estate will have to provide for her, that's a Tanai Betin, so we suspect that maybe he already gave her some money, he put some money away um, for her while he was alive, and therefore maybe she already got that payment, and when we can't be sure whether she got that payment or not, and therefore it's not fair to take from lien property when it could be that he paid it during his lifetime. That's only true for his own daughter. Um, a father would do that for his own daughter, first of all, because his own daughter, and because uh, this is a basic uh, requirement of betin. However, for his stepdaughter, that's a different story. That he's, he doesn't, he's not obligated by Itanai Betin, and he wouldn't go and give and preempt and give his stepdaughter money while she is, while he was, um, uh, if he didn't have to, um, uh, before, before he's obligated. Um, and so therefore, um, in the, with the, for the stepdaughter, we assume that he didn't give her anything, and that's why there's a full obligation for her, and she can collect from lean, leaned property, and that explains all the difference. Okay, so that completes um, this uh, challenge to Ula, and now we're going to have one more challenge to Ula. Tashema Amar Rabbi Natan, Ematai, בזמן שקדם מכחו של שני לשבחו של ראשון, אבל קדם שבחו של ראשון למכחו של שני גובה מנכסים משומד, משובדים, על מה משום דלה קדם הוא. רבי נתן has a limitation on the law of our Mishnah and says when is that true that the, um, this guy, uh, Mr. A, buyer of A, cannot take from the lien property of B, that's when um, he the buy the 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 buying the purchase of B uh, was per first before the first guy improved his property. In other words, it's like this: thief A, thief this thief he has pri he has property that he owned from before. He also steals the um, the steals land A. Then A buys the land from the thief. That, uh, that piece of land, and then the thief also sells the land that he had already owned legitimately uh, to B. After that, the buyer of A improves the land. So, you see, at the, at the time that B, that A bought the land, um, it wasn't 
well, at the time that B bought his land, um, the land was not yet improved, and therefore his the lien can only be on uh, the lien is only for what the land is currently worth, not for the improvement, and so that's when um, they cannot he cannot take it. However, let's say the order was different, and the uh, buyer of A uh, takes the land and he puts in money and improves the land and has produce. And only after that, B buys the un, un, a different piece of land. In that case, at the time that B bought the land, that he um, A has a lien on the land for that cur the current value, which is the increased value, including the improvements and the fruit. And in that case, they A would be able to collect from B not only the purchase price but also the improvement um, on the land. All right, so that's what it says here. Uh, if he if the shevach of the first came before the sale to the other guy, then he can he can collect even for the produce. Now. Why is this a question? Therefore, it's only because he didn't uh, d take it first. But if he did take it first, then he can collect. He can collect even though it's not written in the contract, right? And so we see here that this is goes against the idea that it has to be in the contract. Um, and so that's a, a challenge to Ula. And this one we do not answer. Um, instead, we bring a Braita Tanaehi, and we realize that the machloket between Ula and the Bichanina actually, actually, they each have sources and and Tanaetic sources, Tanaetic opinions. The Tanya and Mosi and Lachilat Lachilat Perot or Shevach Karkaot of the Mizon Isha Vabanot Menechasim Eshubadim Ipne Tikun Haolam Lefi Sheen Ketubin. So this is the Tanah Kama of the Brayta. Says that you, you, um, the sec, the buyer of land A cannot take fra for the produce and for the um, improvement of the land, and also for other cases like uh, paying uh, for the 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 um, a widow and daughters the from the estate. For they uh, none of these people can collect from lien property, and all this is mipneti kun haolam. In general, we want buy, we want to protect buyers, and we want to limit repossessions of buyers um, now and the re and but and in all these cases they have a common denominator in that they're not written and so if it's written then the buyers can go and check check the roster check the public record and see is there a lien on it and then the buyer can take that into account that's fine buyers will do that we do that today but if it's an unwritten uh, um, obligation, then how's a buyer supposed to know all the unwritten obligations that a person made? And nobody will want to buy land because they have to worry about some unwritten obligation and then their land will be repossessed. So therefore, anytime it's unwritten, um, uh, we the, the, there cannot be a lien. That is the position of Rabbi Yochanan and Ula. And however, Amar Rabbi Yoseh, V'chimati kun haolam yesh bez bezo, v'halo en kesubin. Rabbi Yoseh says, why would you have to say mipine tikun haolam for that? That's the basic law anyway, without tikun haolam, is that if there's no contract, then there's no lien. Uh, so instead, Rabbi Yoseh explains a different reason um, and says that, that the tikun olam was because it's not a fixed amount. All the things, what are the common denominator and all these things? This is improvements, uh, produce, uh, um, sustenance of a person. All these are a, not a fixed amount. And therefore, the buyer cannot possibly take into account, I don't know how much is uh, this, this produce or the sustenance is going to be, $1,000, $10,000, and buyers will not want to buy because it's not a fixed amount. That is the reason, and so Rabbi Yosef's opinion follows that of Rabbi Hanina. The next and last section of the Mishnah said, If I find an item and I come to you and you say, I find $50, and then you come and say, wait, there was $100 here. I want you to swear that you didn't uh, find 100 and uh, pocket half of it. I don't have to swear, right? I'm the one that is giving, is bringing, uh, I found your wallet and I'm bringing it to you in the first place. I could have just pocketed everything myself. And so therefore, finders should be believed. 
And this is because of Tikkun HaOlam. If I find something and I know, oh, if I return, I'm going to have to swear. I don't want to take a swear. It's a serious thing, even if it's true. But um, people don't like to take swears. And therefore, I might not return it at all. And so it's actually better for everyone not to have to swear. We'll believe something. If he says he found the wallet with, with uh, half the money in it, then he doesn't have to swear. That's just fine. Now, we're going to see a differing opinion. Let's say there's two purses that were tied together, right? Two, two money bags, and so he had them tied together. Now, the, I, I, came, I found one of them, and I return it to you. Now, you say, wait, there were two that were tied together. And so you're claiming that there must, I must have found both of them, and I pocketed one, and I'm only returning one. And I claim, no, I only found one. I don't know how they got undone somehow. So the so because of that, nishba, I have to make a swear. Uh, this is according to the Bitzchak. Same thing. If I come and return one ox, and you say, "Wait, the two oxes were tied. There were two oxes there. They were tied, and they were tied together. And therefore, this is suspicious. I'm sure that they must have been tied together." And you found them, untied them, and took one, and they're only returning one. The Yitzchak says, in that case, yes, I as the finder have to swear that I only found one. Okay, my Tama, we interrupt to say, why does he have both of these cases? Oxen can become detached from each other themselves, because they move around, and so they might become detached, and there's more reason to believe. Uh, the finder, whereas pouches do not by themselves become detached from, from, uh, from each other, and therefore, if uh, the finder says I, that I only found one of them, um, it's less likely uh, that we should believe him. Nevertheless, it doesn't matter. In both cases, um, Rabbi Yitzchak requires uh, the finder to make a shivua, whether they're things that move around and separate or, or not. Now, continues. And yet another case, um, if I come and say, I found, uh, I did in fact find two oxen, um, but I already, I already returned one of them to you, and now I'm just returning the other one. Um, so then I have to make a vow also that I in fact found two, and, but I, and I already returned one. Okay, so that's the Bizchak's uh, rulings, and so now we ask the Bizchak. Let Lamo Seme Mesia Lo Yishabam Beneti Kon Haolam. Does the Bizchak disagree with our Mishnah? Does he not agree that someone who founds finds an object, an object does not have to take a swear because we want to encourage people to return objects, and that will help people who lost objects because then more people will return it. Does the Bizchak not agree with this? Right, we evidently from here that he does, he in fact requires one to make a shivua, even though he's only the finder, if the person who lost it claims that there was more that was uh, together with it. And the answer is yes, in fact, he disagrees. Who? The Amad, Kedabi Eliezer ben Yaakov. Rabbi Yitzchak agrees with a different Tana, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, the Tanya, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, Omer, Pamim Shadam Nishba al Ta'anat Asmo. Says that a person sometimes has to take a vow even for his own claim, his own admission. Let's step back a second. This is it gets into the very important sugya of Mode Bemiksat. Um, if uh, someone comes and says um, uh, uh, that I owe him a hundred dollars, right? Now, if I would deny him altogether, let's say he has no he has no document. So if I would deny him, I said, no, no, I don't know who you are. I never met you before. I don't know you any. I don't owe you anything. Then I'd be off the hook because he has to prove it. However, here's the paradox. If I admit and say, you're right, I did owe you a hundred dollars, but I already paid you fifty. So therefore, I only pay you fifty more. In that case, we uh, the the law is that I have to swear that I already paid back fifty. Um, so even though I could have denied the whole thing, if I admit to some of it, then I'm already giving credence to the claim. Right? Yes, I don't. I do know who you are. There was in fact a, a history between us. I did in fact owe you a hundred. Since I'm admitting all that, um, now I have to make a vow. To uh, uh, for the other fifty. Okay, that's the law in general. If someone else has a claim against me, 
How, but what if I, I generated the claim on my own? Uh, so to be able to says, even if I generated the claim by admitting something that the other person may not even have known about, I still have to swear. For example, let's say um, the, a father died and now the son comes and I go to the son. And I say to the son, listen, I owed your father a hundred dollars, but I already paid him 50. So now the son, he didn't know about this before. He didn't make a claim. I'm the one that's generating, generating the claim, letting the son know, hey, I owed a hundred dollars to your father. And now since he's dead, I owe you a hundred dollars since I, I generated, generated the claim. And, and, and now I'm saying I already paid 50. Even though I generated the claim, I still have to swear about the other 50. And so this is Nishba uh, al-Tanat Atzmo. Now, so we're making a comparison between this and Hashavat Aveda, right? Even though for Hashavat Aveda, it's just, I found something, but they're also, I'm kind of generating the claim by saying, hey, I found a wallet, um, but there was, you know, only this amount in it. Or I found uh, uh, I found a pouch, and the other says they were connected together. But I'm the one that generated the uh, the interaction to begin with. I didn't have to uh, say anything. So to be Elizabeth Yaakov, we're comparing the two. It's kind of like Hashabat Aveda. I'm going to the son and say, hey, you didn't know about this, but I owed your father a uh, hundred, and I paid him fifty, so I owe you fifty. So I'm re- kind of like returning some a lost object. And to be Elizabeth Yaakov says I have to swear in that case. Therefore, Rabbi Yitzchak is, uh, is following Rabbi Elzebin Yaakov and says that someone who's returning a lost object also would have to swear, yes, even though um, the other guy uh, didn't know about it before, or even though the other guy is the one who lost an item and uh, would, not, would not be able to, to uh, find it otherwise. Okay, Chachamim say, no, this is like returning a lost, a lost object, so we're agreeing that they're both like lost objects, but Chachamim say, patur, if I admit to my own claim, and I say, yeah, I owed you, you didn't know about this, but I owe you 100, now I only owe you 50, and you didn't know about it to begin with, then that's like returning a lost object. Returning a lost object, I do not have to uh, pay back. Uh, I don't, I don't, sorry, I don't have to swear. And so Chachamim are the, here are the Chacham, same, same as our Mishnah, that says no swear, and Rabbi Yitzchak follows Rabbi Elizabeth ben Yaakov. Okay, good. Now we're just going to analyze Rabbi Elizabeth ben Yaakov's uh, uh, statement a little bit more. But Rabbi Elizabeth ben Yaakov, let le meshiv abeda patur, would, would Rabbi Elizabeth ben Yaakov not agree that returning a lost item is patur? Uh, after all, Amar Rav beto'ano katan. Uh, Rav said that this this machloket up here is, is, is talking about a case where a child, let's say the, it's an orphan, let's say the orphan is a minor and says, wait, I, I think that you owe my father something. So in other words, it wasn't that I came out of my sheer goodwill without any prompting and said, I owe you, I owe your, I owed your father a hundred and I paid him half, I owe you 50. It was not from sheer goodwill. Actually, it was a minor orphan that came and did make a claim against me. And so it's not really the same as Hashavat Aveda, where uh, it is from my pure goodwill, I found something, and I, I want to return it. And there was no claim, uh, no claim or knowledge at all. So isn't that true? And in, in that case, um, there would not be a good comparison. Um, so we answer. No, if a child makes a claim, that's worth nothing. As the Mishnah Shavuot says, that as someone who's a mute, imbecile, or minor who makes a claim, they are not. Uh, they don't have the uh, intellectual capacity to make a valid claim, and therefore we just dis- we disregard it totally. And so therefore, um, it is the same. As a uh, as as hashavat aveda, um, so now we explain. Uh, we have to explain Rav because Rav did say it's when a katan um, uh, makes a claim. My katan gadol umbamai karela katan delegabe mile daviv katan who you're right. We're not talking about that the orphan is a minor, but rather the orphan is an adult. So why are you calling him a child? Because compared to his father, he is a child, right? I mean, you, sometimes you have a, a, a father who's 100 years old and his child is 80 years old. He's still called a child. Um, so here, compared to his father, he is a child. And uh, the point is that the child doesn't know necessarily all the affairs of his father. The father died and the son doesn't quite know. Um, what, what, was there a claim here? Was it paid? Was it half paid? 
and so therefore his claim is only is is uh, he is an adult, so his claim is worth something, but it's not full um, because I could say, oh, you weren't around, I paid back your father, um, and so uh, therefore. Um, this is what Av is saying, and uh, and uh, in fact, there is some claim uh, there by an adult, and that's where that's where to be Eliezer Ben Yaakov said one has to swear. Now we ask further on this interpretation. Why would you call Rabbi Eliezer Ben Yaakov says there are times when someone has to swear even when he generates his own claim, but here he's not gener generating his own claim; it's generated by someone else, by the adult son. And the answer is Tanat Acherim Vehodaat Asmo. You're right; it was generated by someone else, but I admitted to it, and so that's that's what it means by um, I generated the claim because I admitted. You're right; I did owe your father a hundred, but I paid him back. So because I admitted to it, that's why I have to pay. We ask on that. Kuluhu Tanata Name Tanat Acherim Vehodaat Asmo Ninhu. Hold on; that is the typical case of Modeba Mixat. Every case of Modeba Mixat is someone makes a claim that I owe them a thousand. I agree. I agree to 500, so I have to swear about the other 500. So this is this every this is every case. Okay, so we're saying you're right. This would be this is actually a typical case of Modebe Mixat. However, it still could make a difference whether I um, am dealing with the father or dealing with the son. The difference would be the logic behind Modebe Mixat in the first place. I mentioned it's kind of a paradox. If I say I don't know you anything, I never met you before then I'm scot-free. But if I admit to half, then I have to, then I obligate myself to a swear. What's the logic? It's psychological. As Rabbah said, how come the Torah says, yeah, one has to swear? Because we have a presumption that a person will not be so brazen to completely deny his creditor. Um, there are professional lawyers out there, professional con men, and you know those guys. Yeah, they may maybe they maybe they would say an outright lie, but most people are kind of honest. And uh, you know we might bend the truth a little halfway, but most people are not so brazen to tell an all-out lie. So we're going by most people. So vehai bekule ba'ele mechaperele. Really, when the, when some guy comes and claims, hey, I, 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 I owe him a thousand dollars. Really, I would I would want to deny the whole thing and not have to pay. But most people, I can't look at the guy in the eye and say, I, I never met you before, I owe you zero. Right? People are not so brazen. And really, I would want to admit, you're right, I do owe you that thousand. So why don't I admit it? Because I'm trying to push him off, I'm evading him, and I say, listen, I only have 500 now, I'm thinking in my mind, so you know what, I'll admit to 500, I'll pay him the 500 now, and I'm not really lying, because when I get the 500, the other 500, next month, then I'll pay him the rest. So that people will be brazen enough to say, no, I only owe you 500. I, uh, the uh, other 500 I paid. I'm just trying to get out just to buy, to stall, to buy more time. That people would do that. Therefore, therefore make a, make a, make an oath. If I have to make an oath that I, uh, I already paid 500, then I'll think twice about lying. I say, okay, you know, I'm not going to make an oath. Okay, I, I do owe you the thousand. Uh, then I can ask him, hey, do you mind if I pay 500 now, 500 later? I don't have it, whatever. They'll deal with it in the court. Um, but this is the logic, this is the psychological uh, insight that people are not going to um, deny outright. They're going to do, people will give to say half a lie in order to buy time, and the oath is meant to counter that. If, on the other hand, someone says, I don't owe you anything at all, then uh, they wouldn't be so brazen if they were lying. So then we assume that they're telling the truth, and the other guy has to go bring bring proof that there is uh, that there is a loan out there. Okay, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov Sabad lo shena beno ve lo shena bibno lo lo shena bo ve lo shena bibno eno meiz veilkach lav meshim lav meshiv avedahu. Now Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov takes this logic and he says this applies not only to the father. 
with whom that I or that who with who, from whom I already or originally took the loan, but it applies also to the son. A person would not even look at the son in his face and say, "Hey, I don't owe you anything at all," when he knows full well that he owes him a thousand. And therefore, um, it's not like Mishiv Avod uh, Aveda. It's not the same as Mishiv Aveda. And therefore, I do have to have to swear. In the case of Mishiv Aveda, then I, you had no, you had no, you had no idea that uh, uh, who I was, and I didn't know you anything. So there, even the Bialis Binakov may say that I don't have to swear. But if it's um, if it's a case where the son comes and makes a claim, and I'm, I would not deny him altogether, so I would deny half, however, to buy time. So we he would require making a vow in this case as well, whether to the father or to the son. Whereas Rabbanan, the Rabbanan Sabre, Bo and Odeno Meiz, Avabib no Meiz, Medela Meiz, Mashiv Meshiv Avedahu. Rabbanan say, and I would only be, uh, uh, I would only um, not be brazen against the father and deny the father because I, I, I was there and he was there when I got the thousand dollars to begin with. I'm not going to be brazen to lie in his face. But the sun most people would be brazen enough to lie to the son and say, no, I never, no, no, no loan. I don't know what you're talking about because the son doesn't really know 100% himself uh, what went on. And since um, I would lie totally to the son and say there was, I owe you nothing. And if instead I say, you know what? I do owe you half the amount. So therefore I, sh I am, should be believed. And the other half um, is like Meshiv Aveda I am returning something that was lost that you would had no would would not have any have had any claim to, and therefore there is no shivua. So in fact, we're explaining the machloket uh, according to Rav uh, uh, Rav's explanation. Uh, we're explaining the machloket between Rabbi ben Yaakov and the Rabbanan about two different views about how to apply the psychological insight of Rabban. Does it apply only to the father, or does it apply also to the son? Um, and and uh, uh, therefore, this has to do less with Meshiv Aveda for Rabbanan. It would be, in fact, the same as Meshiv Aveda, but it doesn't mean that Rabbi Eliezer Ben Yaakov would say that one has to make a vow for Meshiv Aveda. No, one only has to make a vow for Modeh B'Miksat, just that Rabbi Eliezer Ben Yaakov applies it to the father as well. Baruch Adonai Leolah.